pray for some help for meditating God's word. Father, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to the world of understanding in your church. And Father, there, we acknowledge there are many things in the Bible that we may never fully grasp or understand. There are mysteries here. Lord, we know that you do still call us to dig deeper and to seek ever to understand the word, to grasp more firmly. In particular, the gospel and all its outworkings. And as we consider tonight the doctrine that we acknowledge good people take different opinions and views on. Lord, help us to arrive at your truth. But Lord, to hold it with all humility. And we pray for this help in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our study in the five doctrines of grace, which have been summarized for us um, by the acrostic Chillip. And last time we looked at the doctrine of um, total gravity, and we explained a lot of what that meant. It's a description of the extent of the pollution um, or the impact that the fall has had upon human nature. It doesn't mean that every human being is entirely, utterly polluted. What it means is there's no part of humanity that isn't. And that way, we are totally affected and impacted by the fall. And it's only by God's common grace that we are not as bad as we have the potential each to be. And uh, you may say, well, how is that a doctrine of grace? Well, it's a doctrine of grace in this way. That despite how bad humanity has, has become corrupted, despite that, God still has set his love upon us. That's grace. We will never understand the magnitude of God's grace until we understand the magnitude of what he has covered, what he has um, forgiven. And so hence um, the doctrine of grace that is labeled with depravity. Tonight we come to the U in Chillip and uh, we're looking at unconditional election. This doctrine describes the very, very first step in the order of events that culminates in our salvation, that ends ultimately in salvation being completed in us in heaven and glory. That outcome is the end result of a process worked out through time, through salvation events, which begins with way back before the world was even made when God chose, God elected people to be redeemed. We are given this insight not from theologians' imaginations, but from various passages of scripture. Here's one that we read from, where it is simply stated, and in a matter-of-fact way, Paul writing to the Ephesians saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, For he chose us in him. When? Before the creation of the world. Why? To be holy and blameless in his sight. What motivated him? In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. This passage, along with many others, some of which we'll look at later, indicate that God took the first step in our salvation. Period. Full stop. He chose, he elected, and the word elect simply means to select, he selected those who are being saved. And he did so before any human being was ever even seen or born. Because God made this choice before anybody existed, it's clear that his choice was not based on 
anything that anybody had done or had not done, and that his choice was therefore unconditional. There was no condition that, that those children had to meet before they were picked. It was unconditional in this way. This is why this pilgrim is called unconditional election. God choosing him to ensure that no one would ever imagine that they had contributed to their salvation in any way, even by the act of choosing him, he made the selection before the creation of the world. Robert Raymond, who we quoted last time, and gives us this, this rather comprehensive summary of what theologians mean by this doctrine of unconditional election. And some was drawn from that passage we've read. We read, before the creation of the world, out of his mere free grace and love, God elected many undeserving sinners to complete and final salvation without any foresight of faith or good works or any other thing in them as conditions or causes which moved him to choose them. That is to say, the ground of their election is not in them, but in him. Now, there are many uh, accusations, objections raised against this doctrine, as you may be familiar with. For example, some accuse the doctrine of election of making the universe into a machine and people into robots uh, who aren't able to make decisions or choices about anything because they're just simply following the program of what God has already decided before time began. Others accuse God or, or accuse this doctrine presenting God as being unjust, that it's simply not fair, that he would choose some and therefore not choose by implication others. That doesn't seem fair. And uh, we we'll explore those objections after we spent some time first presenting how the Bible presents this doctrine in the first place, this doctrine of election. So how does the Bible present it? Well, we find the doctrine stated all over the place, and usually in a, a very matter-of-fact way, assume that we simply take it and receive it. And here is one example of that. In Acts 13, when the Gentiles heard this, they were the gospel that had just been preached to them. They were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal salvation or eternal life believed. Some accuse the doctrine of election as being an evangelism killer, something that would destroy our passion to reach out to people and because, well, sure, this doctrine is true, well, there's no point because God's already picked everybody and it's going to be automatic that they all get to heaven one day. So why bother? But that's actually not how the doctrine is presented to us in the scriptures. It is, in fact, presented in scriptures as the exact opposite, as an encouragement to engage in the work of evangelism. Because what it does is, it guarantees success to those who go out to preach the gospel for it. It confirms that even though you preach in the hardest of places, or work in the hardest of places, and share the gospel in one-to-one -one evangelism, you can be sure that no matter how hard the hearts are, God will soften the hearts of those whom he is, he is called. And so there's a great encouragement to engage in the work of evangelism, just as was happening here in Acts 13. Hence Paul says this, Therefore I endure everything, all the hardships of ministry, all of the discouragements of being an evangelist, a preacher, a missionary. He says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. He pressed on because he knew that they would be gathered in and that God has chosen as his instrument to bring in the elect, to bring them, to, to progress them along this process least their salvation he has chosen. Foolishness, preaching, of sharing the gospel verbally. And he says that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Another place where the doctrine of election is described for us, and a bit more is done by way of explanation of it, 
as presented here for the culture of God's people, says, Paul writes again, Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and who we call according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of the Son, that he may be firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So here the doctrine is presented as a comfort that if God has begun a good work in you, he's going to finish the job. He's got this process, he's working along, and he, if he has started it, he will finish it. So it was an encouragement to believers who may fear that they might wobble off the way. Um, here he encourages them uh, since they have been predestined, since they've been and shown that, and the evidence of that, being their response to the word, well, then he will continue to work in them, follow them, them right through to their, their glorification. Now, in the following chapter, then we have another. Fuller um, defense of the sovereignty of God to choose in the doctrine of election. Here Paul writes, using the example of God freely choosing between two twins, between a set of twins, one of those twins, those twins being uh, Jacob and Esau. And he says, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, it wasn't conditional their election or anything in them at all. In order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she, that is their mother, was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So Paul clearly states that Jacob's election to be blessed was not based on any good thing or bad thing in him. In fact, it was despite the, the, twist, the twisting nature that Jacob had that he was uh, chosen. Both Jacob and Esau were sinners, deserving to be punished for their sins, but God was free, free to choose to love one and to, to elect him. His election was unconditional. One more example before we come to the objections is found in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4 and 5. We read, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. How do we know? Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. What Paul was talking about in this passage was, how do we know who's alive? How do we know? We can't see and in some ways we can't see definitively always because some seem to be the genuine article but how may we know if we lack assurance in our salvation well here's why it's evident by our response to the word of god the gospel came to thessalonians not simply with words it wasn't just a new idea they took on board for a while a new philosophy that they followed while it was in fashion no it came to them with power it transformed them. They became Christians and began to live contrary to the flow of the world around them. It came to them with power of the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. And so here is how we know when someone is elect. It is by the response that they get to the Word of God, how it begins to transform them. Certainly the Thessalonians may have pointed to the day whenever Paul first set foot in their, their city. He said, there was the day when I was convicted. There's the day when I was saved. There's the day whenever I chose to follow Christ. But that wasn't the beginning of their salvation. That makes it controversial. They only had a free choice. They only chose Christ because God had first worked on their heart by the Holy Spirit to cause them to desire mercy and to seek his face in the first place. God had first chosen them. There. It's a rather 
with Dennis. I appreciate our other Dennis uh, presentation of the, of the doctrine. Uh, it's quite a lot of words on the screen here, I appreciate it. Let's look at two objections and then I'll work get the light is done. First objection is the ones I mentioned actually at the start. The objection that this doctrine, the way you present this, the way you're reading the scriptures here, this doctrine of election seems to make the universe into a machine and people into robots just following the program of God as well. So it doesn't therefore matter what you do. And God has already decided anyway, so let's just live the way we want and God's going to save me if I'm going to be saved and he won't if he is, hasn't chosen me. Well, that is a very fatalistic way to look at the world. It's a very fatalistic way of looking at the way God has made the world. Because that's not how, uh, and it's not how God has presents himself in relation to people. God doesn't relate to us as a programmer does to a robot. He relates to us, we are told, in love, which means he works with us on the basis that we are genuine people, persons, the feelings that he's given to us. And so we have this motivation that we read earlier for God choosing. It says, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God is emotionally invested in his creation. And we get that even in relation to those who do not one day choose him. For he says in the prophet Ezekiel chapter 32 verse 11, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Does that sound like uh, an impersonal God who doesn't care? Some he chooses and he cares not. Some he doesn't choose and he cares not. It's a description of power in this land. That's not the kind of, that's not the nature of God that's described for us in these passages. The Bible is actually full of God's appeals to people to return. And so he treats us as living beings, not as robots. For example, Jesus. One of the most famous gospel appeals in the New Testament. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So the doctrine of election cannot be accused of making or deleting people's wills so that they don't exist, so that they don't really have the choice. Why else would God appeal so much to people to make a choice of that word of peace? He doesn't delete or ignore the fact that we have a capacity, he's given us a capacity to make choices. And we are held accountable, of course, for the choices we make. And some say we are the product of the choices that we make. Jesus taught that our eternal destination is determined by our choice, our decision, what we do with Jesus. Jesus himself said this. In John 3, verse 18, whoever believes in him, referring to himself, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So there are people that are being held accountable for whether they believe or not, whether they choose to accept Christ or not. So people do have a choice. And that, that is accommodated within the doctrine of election. The problem is not whether or not we have a choice. The problem is that in our decision making processes, we are prone to follow our heart's desires. 
we're prone to follow what we want deep down but ultimately will it influence what decisions we make in life and the pollution remember that's in the human heart from the first doctor in the face to the prophet he prepares us for this reality that because the heart is so polluted with sin and his desires are only wicked and entirely and all the time we are prone to make bad choices we're steered to make choices that are harmful to us that are foolish and as a result of that pollution of that fallenness of us, none of us would ever choose choose Christ even though we have the option to none of us well not because our, we don't have a will to choose but because we don't want to and so it's like God has broken the doors open of the prison houses of this world with the power of the cross and he beckons come, come and he even comes and takes the very chains off our ankles and like this and ankles nobody wants to get up nobody wants to come out why? because we deep down love our sin we love to let our lives as they are. We, want, we, do, we don't want the disturbance of following Jesus because our perspective and our understanding of everything around us is so warped and so fallen that we cannot see what's good for us. Jesus revealed the pain that that rejection of his offer of grace caused him whenever he was arriving in Jerusalem for the final time. And he read that he cried, lamented, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but what? You were not willing. Their will, which, in, fact, in which they made choices, was flawed in this way, they were not by. They had the opportunity to choose Jesus. They had a choice to make, and who did they choose? A few days later, they chose Barabbas, a murderer. That was how, that's, that's how warped the human heart is. Choose a murderer over a saviour. That seems a very extreme example, but it's just to make, make the point. So God clearly doesn't relate to us, is what we're saying, um, as though to robots. He doesn't treat us as robots. We have wells. Whether they're free or not, well, yes, they're free in one sense and that we can make choices, but they're seriously skewed. Our decision capacity, making capacity is seriously skewed and steered by the wants and desires that lie behind that, that steer and influence our decisions. And that is our great problem. God reveals his love for us and he also reveals his respect for us and for the human will by not forcing anybody to choose them. So that as humanity says no, if people say no, God doesn't come in and force people. He respects that decision rather fearfully actually. He respects that decision. Our capacity to be able to choose is therefore not enough open the possibility that some might be saved, some might choose him possibly because of this bias we have in our hearts to love darkness. The only thing that will make a difference is if by God's God, if God by his grace changes the heart, begins to work in the heart of a person so that they desire different things, so that they begin to desire mercy and to seek God's face. And that is a work of grace. And it's that work of grace when it begins then changes the heart that then begins to impact on the decisions we make. And that should lead to the moment whenever then, with our wills, we do choose Christ. That only is possible whenever what we want in the first
first place has been changed and God is working in heart. Second objection, and it's probably the one we hear most and much shorter because we're nearly finished, is that state committed, maybe stated this way, but we stated it in a lot of different ways, is how can God be just if he behaves this way, choosing some but not others? This is an easier objection to answer because it's actually raised for us in the scriptures. If we go back to the passage in Romans 9 that we had up on the screen earlier, pardon me, we have um, we had this passage that showed that uh, God's choice of Jacob over Esau was not based on anything good or bad in them, and, um, and it's simply God exercised his free sovereign will. Um, love Jacob and love Esau. Now, after making that statement, which is rather shocking when you see it, might shock us for a little bit. Hey, it cannot really be the right translation. But Paul, as he wrote that, anticipated the shock in his readers, anticipated the sharp intellect of air and said, Hold on now, there's something not right. This can't be right. And he, he anticipated that because he writes in the very next verse. What then shall we say is God unjust? Because that's what it sounds like. God chooses one and not the other, not based on anything in them. Just picks one and leaves one. How is that fair? Then Paul states in response what God said to Moses. I will have mercy on him, I will have mercy. I will have compassion on him, I have compassion. It is God's divine right to exercise clemency, to pardon one and not another. God reserves the right to do that. And that's simply what we're told in the scriptures. That's what's presented to us. To use an image borrowed from the prophets Amos and from Zechariah, imagine humanity as being like this big pile of sticks. It's all ready for the fire. All humanity, if it were to receive justice, would all be burned, would all go into punishment. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, without exception. That would be justice for us all to face the penalty of our own sins. But God decides to make, has decided to make a sovereign choice because he can, because he is God. And he lifts a huge handful of those sticks. It's a multitude that cannot be numbered. It's a large number of people. And he lifts that number of people and sets them over here. And he decides to make something beautiful out of them. Now, can the first pile that's left say they have received an injustice? No, they can't because. It is just that the whole lot deserve to face the punishment for their sins. And can those who have been picked, can they say this has been an injustice? Or no, they can't, because this is what grace is. This is what clemency is. And no one can accuse God of injustice because every, no one has got anything they didn't deserve. So Paul finishes off his argument. I state an even more blunt thing, even more controversially for some. Therefore, God has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and He hardens whom He wants to harden. Who does He harden? He hardens those who have already decided. What it means is those who have already decided to reject Him. Well, He hardens them in that decision that they've made. They have the choice. They made their choice. It just means He fixes them in that choice. So that the tree lies the way it falls, so to speak. So that's the way we all would be. We all would be hardened in a position of not choosing Him if we were left to ourselves. So salvation is all of grace, it's all of the Lord. And it's according to His free choice. Only He can truly. Oh, something I call free will. To close um, our meditation, Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. 
Because your mouth, you would never choose him. He says, the Lord has to apply salvation to make the unwilling willing. That's the hard work that God does to make us even want to choose him in the first place. To make the ungodly godly and bring the vile rebel to the feet of Jesus or else salvation will never be accomplished. Amen. That's a lot to take out. There are maybe other objections you would like to have a coffee over and enjoy and have a debate with. Uh, I'm open for that. Maybe in touch if you'd like to uh, and chat more about this particular area of God. Because I haven't even got to the most controversial one yet. Um, so they, they just get better. <laughs> so let us uh, bring our service to the to close of the second and final hymn. And who is on the Lord's side?